I'm just about to jump on a Zoom call with Inna Braverman. She is the CEO and uh, co-founder of Eco Wave Power, which is an Israeli-based wave energy company. Sometimes in order to really make something work, you need to be thinking outside of the box. Wave energy is the most predictable source. It has much higher potential, let's say, than solar because it also works at night. Could you tell me a bit about your, like, what you were like as a child, what you enjoyed studying at school, and um, yeah, start from there. I live in Israel, but I wasn't born here. I was born in Ukraine. Back then it was USSR. Two weeks after I was born, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, uh, which was the worst in history uh, nuclear disaster. I was one of the babies that got hurt in the explosion. I actually had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. And uh, luckily my mother is a nurse, so she came to the crib on time and uh, gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which saved my life until the ambulance came. I always feel like, wow, there must be something special if I got a second chance in life, you know. It's... Yeah. So uh, I really decided to devote my second chance to doing something good. One of the main reasons uh, for my passion uh, towards renewable energy, I do think that uh, harnessing clean, safe electricity is definitely a, a good cause. Uh, but of course, I didn't know it as, as a baby. <laughs> uh, so um, actually, I went to study in uh, Haifa University political science. Yeah. Uh, because I thought that maybe the best way to really make a positive change in the world is through politics. You know, when I finished my university, there was no uh, lineup of politicians waiting to hire a, <laughs> a political science major. So uh, that, that didn't go as planned. I did start working for a renewable energy company and there I discovered the benefits of uh, solar energy, wind energy, wave energy, but nobody was really able to make a uh, commercialized uh, wave energy technology mm -hmm. and that really drew me to that that was kind of the beginning of uh, eco wave power okay but you didn't study engineering or science or anything like that so that's a really bold move to move into founding a technology company without that background you know sometimes in order to really make something work you need to be thinking outside of the box yes. I, I really don't think that a person should necessarily have and let's call it uh, education in a certain field in order to make it a success. Yes. If we look, let's say, at an entrepreneur that I personally like, Jack Ma, that uh, founded Alibaba, which became very successful, he's a yes. teacher. Yeah. So it doesn't exactly have anything to do with programming, computers, softwares, and yeah. so on. Maybe it takes somebody who doesn't have that background, you don't have that um, kind of uh, like maybe even emotional uh, attachment to the old technology. Maybe it's easier to start start fresh in a new direction. Do you think that that's been the case for you? I'm not the engineer behind the system because yeah. really uh, engineers have a tendency not to want to go out with the product to the world until they feel that it's perfect. And to be honest, they never feel that it's perfect. The fresh air really helps you with. But it's very, it's hard for an engineer to put out something that you think isn't perfect. So I can see that your your team of engineers would benefit from, from having you to, to provide that kind of push. Could you talk a bit about what are some of those common challenges that the early wave companies found? Yeah, I think that the, the first generation, let's call it of wave energy, uh, maybe was, uh, I'll say it on the positive note, was a bit uh, too courageous. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to start where it's the most complicated. Offshore, yeah. mid big depth, depth uh, middle of the ocean, mm -hmm. crazy high prices, right? Yeah. You need cheap divers, you need underwater mooring and underwater cables. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, you have in the offshore waves of 20 meters and even higher, and no man-made uh, stationary equipment can survive. They were so excited about this 20 meter wave height offshore, or about these huge waves, that they said, let's go and harness it. And you know, and then Mother Nature said, no. <laughs> if we look at other industries that are already commercialized, let's say wind industry, they started with onshore wind, mm. got it commercialized, got the prices down, learned, made, made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot of things, and only when they felt, felt completely comfortable and the industry was already stable, they went to put offshore windmills. Their attempts were very, very valuable also for my company and I'm sure for other companies to learn, to understand. So we kind of learned from their mistake and we said, okay, so let's do 
what is simpler and cheaper and easier. Can you explain to me how does the EcoWave power technology work? Floaters are being attached to existing man-made structures, as I said, yeah. such as breakwaters, piers, jetties, and other types of structures. The floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves. They're pushing a hydro cylinder, yeah. which transmits biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. Okay. A pressure in the accumulators is being built. The higher the wave, the higher the pressure. And this pressure is used to turn the hydro motor, which is turning the generator. And through the inverter, the electricity goes to the grid. So is it a, a continuous output or is it, um, you know, does it rise and fall like with the waves? No, it's a continuous output during wave time because you have the accumulators and the accumulators, they basically smooth your output. According to studies, wave energy is the most predictable source. It has much higher potential, let's say, than solar because it also works at night. For the EcoWave power technology, how much energy is produced per unit or per maybe per meter of, of length that's installed? And let's say in a great location, we can uh, produce uh, one megawatt on, uh, let's say, 50 to 100 meters linear of breakwaters. When you research wave energy on the internet, that's definitely the thing that you see over and over again is people saying wave energy will never work because it's too complicated. You know, um, wind and hydro, it's the moving air, the moving water that directly turns the turbine and that's very efficient. Um, but I also know there's plenty of examples in engineering of, uh, you know, like an internal combustion engine. Obviously, it takes a lot of components to translate a linear motion into a rotational one. So I wanted to hear your thought on that. Is it reducing the potential eventual efficiency or do you think it's just a matter of getting to that point of maturity where it, it becomes more efficient? I do think that uh, having too many moving parts, especially in the water, is a bad thing. So I agree with the with the comments in that regard. On the other hand, the let's say technology like ours handles this problem because we don't have a lot of moving parts so, and they're not in the water. Um, the only thing that is in the water is the floater and the hydro cylinder. So the floater is pushing the hydro cylinder and then the rest, everything that's happening is happening on land. Mm -hmm. So it's not complicated. Maybe using hydraulic in wave energy is something relatively new, but using hydraulics as hydraulics, our elevators work on hydraulics, uh, our cranes work on hydraulics, and yeah. it's a very known and safe industry. Everything is on land, no generator, no inverter, nothing is in the water. So it's actually very, very simple. Still obviously a harsh operating environment with all the salt spray. Um, it's near the water, even if it's not in, a, I know, you know, offshore wind, even though all the complicated stuff is, you know, 100 metres up in the, the air, it's still very expensive to make those components um, survive long enough compared to the same thing onshore. So how, how do you address that? What materials are you using and do you need special hydraulics? Listen, there are special... Uh types of paint, special type of uh, different ingredients that you use in to provide erosion protection. It's no okay. different than ships. Although the available energy offshore is significantly higher than the available energy onshore, the exploitable energy is actually almost the same in the offshore and nearshore. So we can actually take wave energy to the next step and say, okay, not only that we're not expensive and we don't break down, which is yeah. good things to have, but not enough, but we can also produce large amounts of electricity and become profitable. And that would really position wave energy like, okay, it's a serious source of electricity. What yeah. size are these projects, both the ones that you've done and the future ones? How many megawatts? The project in Israel is the same size of the project that we have running in Gibraltar. It's 100 kilowatts at first phase and plan to be expanded in the future. And in Portugal, the plan is to, to have up to a 20 megawatt power station, which is already a big scale for wave energy. It was never built uh, in the past. Well, I have to admit, I was expecting it to be a lot smaller than that because I know, um, you know, there's more energy off, offshore. That I, I know that's, that must be why they took that difficult problem on early on in wave energy because there's so much more energy there before... Yeah, when it comes into shore, it obviously loses energy from the seafloor and um, breaking waves. So there's still, yeah, it sounds like there's still a lot of power left by the time it gets to the, the breakwater. So how do you, where, yeah, where do you see the place for wave energy? First of all, uh, the wave energy potential is tremendous. Uh, two thirds of the world population are living on the coast, on the coastline. So with this type of population distribution, the need for wave energy is undeniable. 
Uh, other than that, according to the World Energy Council, uh, wave energy can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces today. Uh, the density of the water is about 832 times uh, greater than the density of air, uh, which mm -hmm. means that we can produce much larger electricity amounts with much smaller, thus cheaper devices. We do need to incorporate all the sources. It's not like a competition between the sources that one is better than the other. And some countries are more sunny, some countries are more windy, some countries are more wavy. And I do think that the solution for the world is really incorporating all of these sources together. And then we could really have 100% environmentally friendly world. Do you think that wave energy is going to be cheaper than the others or the same price as the other renewable options eventually? We're already comparable to the price of wind and we can definitely compete with, with even lower prices in the near future. Okay, so if the cost is already there, then what's the reason why we don't already see a ton of wave energy projects? Just um, there isn't the demonstrated reliability or, you know, why, why don't you have queues of... That's people? actually a great question. So we have a very unique situation when, where the technology is already there, but the policies, the legislation, legislation the feeding tariffs, the, all the support mechanisms that are needed to kind of uh, instill a new technology into a country are not existent lobbying and discussion with the government and to agree on the policies can sometimes take three to four years. Oh, okay. So that, that's a very actually sad situation where the technology is getting there or is already there and mm. there's no policies and legislation and frameworks to support it. Mm. Uh, we saw the same happening, by the way, with wind and solar 25 and 30 years ago when it just started. Like there's no policy, there's no path. So they need to kind of come up with a completely new legislation and policy for you. And then they sign. And that's a bit unfortunate, but I do think that it will change in the near future. Certainly, you've got a very interesting technology and it sounds like the, the future is going to be exciting for you. Definitely. Yeah. I'm super excited and I really want to make this happen because it will have impact. Even the yeah. research that we're making will have impact on the future generations. And that's a very good feeling. Thanks so much. I, I really, really learned a lot. Thank you for your time. And for yeah. the interview. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.